Before we start, I want to congratulate Megan Nick, who was raised in Shelburne, for winning a bronze medal in Beijing. This is her very first Olympics, and she medaled in her first event. We're all incredibly proud of her accomplishment, and we look forward to celebrating with all our Olympians when they return. We've got uh, a few topics to cover today, including tax relief and masks in schools. But first, I just got off the phone with White House officials and fellow governors, and here's what we heard. CDC Director uh, Walensky said that they are reviewing their guidance, which he reminded us is made on a nationwide basis. It was noted by a fellow governor that the CDC is falling behind where the public actually is, and she stressed that personal responsibility and individual decision-making is key for decisions like wearing masks, which we've been talking about here for quite some time. Dr. Fauci, again, reiterated the importance of boosters. Uh, other than that, there wasn't anything new. Next, as you know, before the school year began, our guidance of schools was, uh, for schools was to require masking until 80% of students were vaccinated. Unfortunately, that recommendation was delayed several times with a decision point scheduled for February 28th. Our team has decided not to delay it again. Throughout the pandemic, we've led the nation in so many ways, and we've done so by taking an incremental approach. And this won't be any different. So I want to be clear. The 80% guidance will be the first phase in a process. We think this is the right step because it was something we developed at the beginning of the school year and something schools have had the time to think about and plan for as February, February 28th approached. However, schools should know this is only the first step. In the very near future, if all goes to plan, we intend to recommend lifting the mask requirement recommendation altogether. Over the last few weeks, several other states, most led by Democrats, have moved in this direction. But for awareness, many states with Republican governors have not required masks in schools to begin with. Across the country, many public health experts are advising schools to move away from mask mandates and other strict measures in schools. And given our nation leading vaccination rate, no place in America is in, better, in a better position to make these changes than Vermont. We're in a new phase with this virus. We have more protections and tools to use, and we understand more about the impacts of mitigation measures. All this means it's time to adapt. Because the fact is, our kids need to get back to normal. They've been through a lot, so we should begin this transition as soon as possible. I want everyone to understand that this came with a lot of thought and deliberation, and we would not be making this change if we didn't think it was the right thing to do. But as I just laid out, between vaccination, Omicron, and more data from around the globe, the time for a shift is now. The risk of kids not being able to see the faces of friends, the anxiety that comes with a constant reminder of this virus, and the ongoing strain on our kids' mental health is far outweighing the risk from COVID amongst this age group and guided our decision. Even though I think more will be upset we're not moving faster, I know for some, moving away from masking won't be comfortable and they may want to continue wearing them and that's okay. We need to be respectful and kind because as we move forward, it's individual circumstances that will drive these decisions. And everyone has the right to make those calculations for themselves. Secretary French will have more details in a few minutes. Next, we're also joined today by Craig Bolio, the Commissioner of Taxes, who will walk us through the tax relief initiatives included in the budget I presented to the legislature. For years, I've talked about Vermont's affordability crisis, and I put forward a number of initiatives to provide tax relief for everyday Vermonters. My 50 plus million dollar progressive tax relief package would benefit tens of thousands of Vermonters, make our state more affordable, help attract workers, help families with kids, 
and much, much more. It includes helping seniors by expanding the income tax exemption for Social Security. Finally, eliminating the tax on military pensions, expanding Vermont's child and dependent care tax credit, allowing Vermonters to deduct 100% of the student loan interest paid on their taxes, providing income tax credits for critical sectors like nursing and childcare, and increasing the earned income tax credit to help low-income families and more. These proposals will benefit more than a quarter of Vermont taxpayers and go a long way towards making Vermont more affordable and growing our workforce. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Bolio for more details. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm here today to talk about the $50.5 million comprehensive and progressive tax relief package that the governor has proposed. This package would expand proven programs and create new strategic credits and deductions to help make Vermont more affordable and help address our workforce challenges. It would help families make ends meet. It would encourage young workers to grow their careers in Vermont. And it would allow more seniors on a fixed income to retire comfortably. So let's talk about what's in the package. First, the governor has proposed an expansion of the Vermont Earned Income Tax Credit. The Earned Income Tax Credit supports about 40,000 lower and moderate income Vermont workers and families by giving a tax break based on earned income. It's an existing federal and Vermont credit that is recognized as a very successful anti-poverty program. The credit available for low and moderate income families, particularly those with children, can make a difference in the lives of these Vermonters. And because it's based on earned income, it can help enhance our workforce. Current Vermont law allows recipients to receive 36% of the federal earned income tax credit on their Vermont tax return. The governor has proposed increasing that to 45%. This increase would elevate Vermont to match the most generous, fully refundable earned income tax credit in the country. Second, the governor has proposed a significant expansion of Vermont's child and dependent uh, care tax credit. This credit helps both lower and middle income working families pay for childcare. While Vermont currently offers two versions of this credit, most families receive 24% of the federal credit on their Vermont taxes. The governor's proposal would expand that to be 65% of the federal amount a family qualifies for and would make the credit fully refundable for all families, which means if the credit is more than they owe in taxes, they'll get money back. This would help about 14,000, sorry, would help more than 14,000 Vermont families pay for childcare expenses and would give Vermont one of the most generous child independent care tax credits in the country. Third, the governor proposes increasing the existing thresholds on Vermont's Social Security income tax exemption by $30,000. Vermont currently allows seniors with, with less than $45,000 of income or couples with less than $60,000 of income to fully exempt their Social Security benefits from Vermont state income tax. But 37 states don't tax Social Security benefits at all through their state income taxes. That includes our neighbors of New York, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Other states that offer a partial exemption like Vermont are almost all more generous than our current treatment. By offering this modest expansion of the thresholds, we would be more in line with other states and reduce the tax burden on an estimated 25,000 Vermont seniors each year. And along the same lines of, of helping retirees, the governor has proposed exempting all military retirement pay from state income tax. Vermont is one of only three states that fully tax this income right now. National data shows that 70% of military retirees retire between the ages of 35 and 50. That means these retirees can join our civilian workforce and bring skills and experience to help with our workforce challenges. Many retirees also bring working spouses to join our workforce and children to enroll in our schools. Data from the Department of Defense shows that since 2016, our population of military retirees in the state has been essentially stagnant, despite additional Vermont service members retiring. Exempting this pay would help the nearly 4,000 retirees here now 
and 750 surviving spouses and dependents, as well as make Vermont more attractive for new retirees. Fifth, the governor is proposing to make Vermont more affordable for both young workers and middle income families by allowing all Vermonters to deduct all student loan interest on their state taxes. This would expand upon a, an existing federal credit that caps at $250,000, uh, sorry, $2,500 of interest paid per year. And Vermonters who have significant student loan payments often exceed that cap. We believe that this proposal would help reduce the tax burden for more than 16,000 Vermonters who either hit the federal cap today or are otherwise ineligible for that deduction. And in addition to the programs I've already outlined, the governor is also targeting two specific sectors experiencing exceptional workforce shortages, nurses and childcare workers. The governor proposes offering every registered nurse, advanced practice registered nurse, licensed practical nurse, licensed nursing assistant, and nurse educator who lives in Vermont and works for a Vermont health care provider, a $1,000 annual refundable tax credit. This proposal is part of a comprehensive retention and recruitment package for nurses that includes increased scholarship opportunities and expanded loan repayment programs in addition to this tax credit to help Vermont recruit, retain, and educate more nurses and reduce Vermont's reliance on traveling nurses. And additionally, the governor is proposing to offer a $1,000 fully refundable income tax credit for all child care workers who are providing private, pre-K, or child care services within the regulated system. The governor believes that this credit will help recruit and retain additional child care workers to ensure that we have the workforce that we need to offer Vermonters affordable and accessible child care services. In closing, we all want Vermont to be an affordable place to live, and the governor's proposed package will provide meaningful tax relief to more than 25% of Vermont resident taxpayers and will help support Vermonters through several different stages of their lives. Thank you. I will now hand it to Secretary Samuelson. Good afternoon. I want to follow up on the Governor and Commissioner Bolio's comments about tax relief. I want to highlight three of the proposed um, tax credits that are related to the Agency of Human Services and the services we provide. One of them, as stated, targets the nurse workforce. The other two are related to child care providers, parents, and guardians. As is the, the case with most human services, the pandemic has made it clear that the need to better support our health care system, the child care workforce, parents, and guardians. There are a number of initiatives to support health care and child care. These ones are th that we're going to talk about today are specifically related to the tax system. Starting with the tax credit for nurses. There is a significant shortage of nurses in our healthcare system. As we've discussed previously, we have supported the healthcare system throughout the pandemic by using traveling nurses. As we transition out of the pandemic, we need to move away from the reliance on travelers. Working to retain the nurses that we already have here in Vermont, recruit new nurses to the state, and address the nursing pipeline including more nurse educators in the state of Vermont. The, pro the proposed tax credits outlined by Commissioner Bolio is designed to support our nurses and nurse educators in Vermont and to attract nur new nurses to the state. Specifically, the, the $1,000 credit for nurses and nurse educators. The governor's budget request also includes, as previously stated, scholarships for Vermonters and out-of-staters who attend nursing programs at colleges in the state of Vermont. In return, these nurses commit to working in Vermont for every year of the scholarships that they receive. That budget request, the budget request also includes loan repayment for nurses who are currently working in the state of Vermont and working with Vermont-based employers. In addition to helping child, in addition to helping healthcare staff, another part of supporting the Vermont workforce is alleviating the cost for childcare and working to shore up our childcare workforce. Childcare costs are, cha are challenging for many of our families in Vermont. One of the tax credits in the governor's proposed budget will help make childcare more affordable for Vermonters, especially those Vermonters served by the Agency of Human Services. 
It would expand the child development tax credit and make it available to families whose children are in child care programs. This change would provide support for over 14,000 Vermont families. The governor has included, in addition, the governor has included another tax credit focused on the child care professionals. The child care workforce tax credit would provide, as stated, $1,000 to approximately 5,500 child care work, uh, workers in the state. It is considered a retention and a recruitment incentive in order to help continue to build the, the much needed workforce and to increase the professionals that we have um, working in Vermont. These expanded tax credits and exemptions will help our Vermont workforce and families sustain our child care system. And as we begin to recover from the pandemic are an important component of how we continue to move forward. Finally for today, I want to announce that I want to remind folks that we will be announcing the wait time study at a press event tomorrow at 10 a.m. here in the, in the pavilion in the Snelling um, conference room. We, will, we are committed to providing throughout the, um, throughout the study um, a thorough evaluation of the results um, and are appreciative of the time it's taken given the, the significant amount of data that we've received in order to, to give careful consideration. Thank you, and now I'd like to turn it over to, to Commissioner Pichek. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Samuelson, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, looking at our COVID presentation this week, we continue to see improved trends and good news uh, across the region, across the country, and here in Vermont as well. Uh, looking across the country, every single state, except uh, for the state of Maine, which has had some reporting issues on their cases, have seen uh, cases drop this week. So in many of these states, they're down over 20%. So we're continuing to see significant improvement close to home, but also seeing significant improvement across the country. Hospitalization rates across the country are down 15%. And finally, the fatality rates in the country are starting to decline as well, down 6 point, or 7.6%. Looking at our Vermont data, again, we see uh, continued improvement here with cases down about 23% over the past week. We're reporting just over uh, 760 cases this week. That's the lower, lowest weekly total we've reported since November 1st. So that was well into um, the pre-Omicron period. So certainly seeing our, our numbers get back uh, to where we were uh, in the middle of the Delta surge, and we expect them to get even lower uh, as we continue forward. Testing is down about 6.7%. Uh, but with the rate of case decline that we're seeing, the positivity rate is continuing to drop as well. And as you'll see on the next slide, the cases are going down across all age groups, uh, particularly important among those older, more vulnerable Vermonters, as we know they're most likely to have severe outcomes from hospitalizations or deaths. Uh, fortunately, those numbers are coming down. Our long-term care facility active outbreak cases are also coming down. And college campuses are relatively stable. The numbers are up just a bit this week at 148. Uh, but again, pretty stable among the college campuses. Looking across the Northeast, as we mentioned, we're seeing broad improvement in our region. Uh, the uh, cases are down about 29%. You can see that Vermont is right in line with the other states in terms of the decrease in cases that we're seeing. This was, of course, not something that happened with the Delta wave. So we're very fortunate and very happy to see this uh, happen, though, with the, re with the decline in Omicron. Uh, gives us more confidence that the trends we're seeing here in Vermont are not just localized in Vermont, but their broad regional trends and improvement. So looking at our modeling slide, we do anticipate that cases will continue to fall uh, throughout the rest of February and into March. Uh, we do think that there'll still be, you know, some virus hanging around our state, whether that's 100 cases a day or 200 cases a day, hopefully we get even lower than that. But there is an expectation that we'll have some uh, level of virus around the state uh, over the next four weeks. And finally, looking at the fatality model, uh, you know, we are waiting for the fatality numbers to come down. They are continuing to be on pace for, for what we experienced in January, uh, but we do expect the second half of February uh, to have the fatality rate decrease uh, based on where our cases are, where the cases are among those that are most vulnerable, and also where hospitalizations and admissions are. So those are all trending in the right direction, and we should see our fatality rate come down here uh, over the next two weeks. Looking at the hospital admissions, those are down 30%, so fewer people going to the hospital. We've been in the single digits over the last couple of days, so that's really an encouraging sign. And that's resulted in our hospitalizations declining. So those that are currently hospitalized, down 15%. Uh, we're now 16 straight days where the hospitalization numbers have been under 100, 
And we're now sort of in that low 70s into the high 60s range uh, and anticipate further improvement over the weeks ahead. Same on the ICU, those numbers are down about 10%, and you can see that um, we continue to see that trend now for a number of weeks. We're down below 20 ICU beds, uh, people with COVID, I should say, in the ICU, down below 20 beds for the last four days. So those all trending in the right direction as well. Looking at uh, hospital availability, uh, the overall medical surgical beds are pretty stable. Uh, they're a little lower, obviously, than I think we'd like to see. They're down in that sort of 40 to 50 range, well below where they were during the Delta surge uh, and prior to the Delta surge, but they are pretty stable. Of course, that's not COVID that's impacting that. The COVID numbers are coming down. And same on the ICU. The ICU availability has trended down, uh, but obviously there's fewer COVID cases in the ICU, so that is not the contributing factors, other factors outside of COVID. Again, looking at the uh, percentage of people who are boosted that end up in the hospital compared to those who are not, the data continues to hold over the last six weeks seven times more likely for someone who's not vaccinated to end up in the hospital compared to someone who is fully vaccinated and boosted. And then finally, turning to our fatality data, you'll see that we are reporting at the moment 30 deaths for the month of February. As we said, this is sort of on pace for the number of deaths that we've seen in January and December. Uh, but unlike those months, uh, case rates are coming down quite significantly. We are seeing the hospital admissions come down uh, quite significantly and anticipate uh, that that will uh, follow suit in terms of the number of fatalities that we see for the rest of the month. And then looking again at the, the data that compares those that are not fully vaccinated to those who are boosted, the data here continues to hold up as well, 7.5 times more likely to die for those that are not fully vaccinated uh, compared to those who are boosted over the last six weeks. So again, all the more reason to get boosted. We know that we have over well over 100,000 Vermonters who are eligible for their booster shot who have not yet gotten it. You can see on this final slide that we had just over 2,600 people get their booster shot this week. So that's probably, uh, that's pretty much the lowest number we've seen since the boosters become widely available. Uh, so we really would like to see uh, that number go up uh, and uh, those 100,000 plus Vermonters that are not uh, yet gotten their booster shot to do so as soon as they can. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichak. Good afternoon. I'm going to start with an update on uh, two initiatives that we announced last week uh, around testing. Uh, first, uh, the supply for antigen test kits for our test at home program in schools remains strong. Uh, so we're moving forward with expanding this testing to independent schools. Uh, second, uh, we also announced a school staff assurance testing program. Uh, each school staff member will be provided two antigen tests uh, each week to use on a voluntary basis. The Department of Health recommends that staff who wish to participate in this program uh, use the two tests uh, three days apart. For example, staff might test on Sunday before the school week begins and then again on Wednesday. Now I have a couple of new announcements uh, that we pre previewed these initiatives last week. Uh, first, uh, as a testing opportunity when returning from February vacation, uh, next week most of our schools will be out on the winter break. Uh, to help schools with the return from vacation, we'll be sending uh, extra tests out this week. Uh, the deliveries will include two tests per student, and these are antigen tests. Students are encouraged to test twice, at least 24 hours apart, in the days before returning to school after the winter vacation. Testing is voluntary and it's not required for students to come back to school after vacation. Next, as we mentioned last week and the governor foreshadowed, there's a lot of conversation about masks in schools at the national and regional levels. Uh, notably, Massachusetts and Connecticut announced uh, that they are not gonna be requiring masks in schools as of February 28th. And then recently, Rhode Island has announced uh, an effective date of March 4th. These states started with Omicron earlier than Vermont, and they're also exiting the Omicron surge earlier than us as well. Although we remain optimistic about the trends we're seeing in Vermont, uh, we're not ready to jump to a recommendation for the removal of masks altogether, but I expect that recommendation will be coming at some point. For now, we will go forward and implement the recommendation uh, we've had in our existing guidance that schools with a student vaccination rate of 80% or greater do not need to require masks. This recommendation will go live on February 28th as per our guidance. 
The 80% threshold was written into our guidance back in August, uh, but we delayed its implementation on several occasions, primarily to allow student vaccination rates to increase. And you might remember when we wrote the guidance back in September, students in age five through 11 were at that point not eligible for vaccination. Now that we have achieved one of the highest student vaccination rates in the country, we are increasingly confident masks can be removed altogether, but we prefer to make incremental steps towards that goal as we have done throughout the entire pandemic. A phased approach, in our opinion, works best for a couple of reasons. We're still exiting from the Omicron surge, and this approach gives us a few more weeks to see those positive trends continue to play out after the winter vacation. We also think the schools and families need more time to prepare for this change. When we do make that recommendation, it'll be just that, a recommendation. Local school districts will be able to choose to implement it or not, although we encourage them to follow the state recommendations which are crafted in collaborations with our public health experts at the Department of Health. To help make this eventual transition as easy as possible, Schools should be reviewing their local mitigation practices and seeking to eliminate the unnecessary ones now. By unnecessary, I mean local measures that go above and beyond the state recommendations and contribute little to virus mitigation. For example, I've heard about schools not letting students talk during lunch, or schools that require students to wear masks during outdoor recess, or to play in small groups or pods on the playground. None of these types of measures are necessary and they send the wrong message to students that our schools are not safe from the virus. Eliminating these types of measures now will help students and staff with the transition to the eventual removal of masks. While we know we'll continue to see cases in schools, our schools are very safe. They are perhaps some of the safest in the country, if not the world, due to our high vaccination rates and robust access to testing. We do need to get our students in our schools back to normal as soon as possible. This means we need to allow our students to do normal things in schools, like talking at lunch and playing on the playground with all their friends, not just those that are in their immediate class or grade. This also means they need to be able to see the faces of their classmates by not being required to wear masks. This will become increasingly important as the recommendations to wear masks outside of school are being lifted and our students and staff transition from those settings to the potentially more restrictive settings of school. Most of our schools will be on a well-deserved winter vacation next week. Some students and staff will travel. Many will enjoy the outdoor activities of our beautiful state. Whether traveling or playing outside, many will experience a welcome break from being required to wear masks since they are not in school. Now with the widespread availability of vaccines, a school's mitigation measures should be the same as those found in a larger community. Increasingly, schools will not require separate mitigation strategies. Masks have been useful in limiting the risks of spreading the virus within our schools, but they have also created a lot of anxiety and placed significant limitations on teaching and learning in our classrooms. The risks from the virus continue to decrease, and that's important to acknowledge. So we need to address the issue of requiring masks in our schools so our students, like their peers in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, can get back to their normal routines as soon as possible. This will not be happening before winter vacation or immediately afterwards, but if continues, con conditions continue to improve, I expect that decision will be made soon and with enough notice so schools and families will have sufficient time to adjust. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. I have a number of items to discuss this morning in terms of updates. While the current picture of COVID-19 in Vermont continues to improve, we continue to plan for the future. Unfortunately, the world has had to accept this virus is not going away and new variants may emerge. But public health experts and scientists, and we in Vermont, believe we'll soon be able to coexist with the virus more safely for several reasons. First, we'll have a lot more immunity, both from Vermont's high vaccination rates and now from more of the population having been infected. Second, Omicron has proven to be milder for most people, especially in those who are vaccinated. 
And third, we have experience with this virus, even though it has changed, so we know who is at most risk. This means that rather than broad recommendations for all Vermonters, we will be more focused in our public health efforts on reaching higher risk populations, working to get them up to date on vaccines and making sure they have access to timely testing and treatment. We'll continue to follow trends in our COVID data to make informed decisions as we have been doing throughout the pandemic. The type of data that we look at is already shifting to metrics like hospitalizations, wastewater surveillance, focused surveillance testing, and genetic sequencing, and will continue to be a critical way we monitor the virus going forward. Though we plan to move deliberately over the next weeks to months, there will be people who want or need to move at a different pace, and that's okay. As we have these past two years plus, we will all need to weigh our personal risks and decide which protections make sense for our own situation. I encourage each of us to make these decisions using medical and science-based information. And then we all need to accept these individual choices with empathy and without judgment. As we move forward with this, we must also truly balance the precautions we take for COVID-19 with the need to recover from all of the other negative impacts we've endured throughout this pandemic. This is the health debt I've mentioned before, the public health concerns that have grown or developed during and as a result of the pandemic. Whether that be addressing substance use, mental health, food insecurity, or improving our own behaviors in health that we can see are contributing to chronic conditions or the social and emotional development and well-being of our children and ourselves, or some lingering effect from the pandemic we haven't even realized yet. These issues weigh heavily on us all, and we must prioritize them now as soon as it's safe to do so. Now, I have a few updates on the booster front, with two recent studies from the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. First one, a review of surveillance data, found that adverse reactions to the messenger RNA vaccine, the Pfizer or Moderna, were less frequent when people received the same type of mRNA booster than after getting their second dose. So less adverse effects after the booster than the second dose. This should give people more confidence that they can get their booster shot safely. The other study that took place across 10 states analyzing messenger RNA vaccine effectiveness against COVID-associated emergency department and urgent care visits did show some waning of immunity by the fourth month after a booster, but it was still quite protective. I believe this highlights the need to continue to collect this type of data to inform us about future booster decisions, something we're asked about weekly here. We also want Vermonters to know that a new monoclonal antibody has received emergency use authorization from the FDA. You're all gonna watch carefully to see that I can pronounce the name of this new antibody, but it's Beb Tilovimab. Vermont is expected to receive 100 doses this week. This is yet another tool to use against the virus, and I again urge anyone at higher risk who tests positive to reach out to your healthcare provider to discuss treatment options soon, and as soon as you can get your result. Finally, I want to speak to parents and caregivers of children under age five. The FDA had planned to begin reviewing data for a vaccine for this youngest age group this week, but instead decided to allow more time for evaluation, including data on a third dose. Now, I know many parents may be disappointed by this delay, which may now push back the process until April, but I believe this is good news. 
as the scientific process was at risk of being pushed faster than the data would support regarding dose and number of shots required for strong immunity. It means we will have a much better picture of the vaccine's effectiveness and will be able to recommend the vaccine with more confidence when it is approved. Lastly, an update about our dashboards. First, you will see a change to our vaccine dashboard tomorrow, and that is to show how many Vermonters are up to date on their vaccines, which of course means a person has received all recommended COVID-19 vaccines, including any booster doses when eligible. And you all know my bias here. You are not fully protected unless you are up to date with the booster dose. We also have a new addition to our data reporting. Later today, we will begin publishing the results of tests that were self-reported by Vermonters. These are the test results people reported to us through the form on our website. While we know that these reports likely only represent a fraction of self-reported tests out there, this reporting helps to fill in the picture of how many tests for COVID are being done. They are not included on our case dashboard because they are not among Vermont's case totals reported by the CDC. Thank you to Vermonters who've been reporting these tests at healthvermont.gov slash report results to help us capture this data. Now I'll turn it back to the governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, do we know at this point what percentage of schools have reached that 80% threshold? We're trying to uh, gather all that data as we speak. Um, we should have more information next week on that. Um, we just need to, to make sure that we can uh, get some accurate information. Do you know if it's maybe half, more than half? I, I don't believe it's, it's, it's a smaller population, I believe. Um, but we want to make sure that we have the accurate information. And we encourage um, those uh, students uh, to get vaccinated uh, so that we can get up to the 80% threshold, so they get a financial incentive as well as uh, being relieved of the mask mandate. Governor, as we mentioned, there, there seems to be a disparity in terms of the vaccination rate, especially for 5 to 11-year-olds. In Chittenden County, it's 78%, uh, where in Essex, it's just 27 So maybe for you or Dr. Levine, I guess in terms of as we approach this February 28th date, what risk does that pose? And also, what is the state doing to help get those numbers up for younger kids? Yeah, and again, we continue to encourage all to get vaccinated. We think it's um, the future, and we think it'll be give protection in the future, and uh, we'll continue to educate uh, those who uh, don't uh, don't want to follow the guidance as to why this makes sense. Uh, we hear a lot uh, from people who say, "Well, I've had COVID, so I should be I have immunity uh, to to COVID." Well, that wanes as well, and uh, and I think that that's the uh, the piece that's missing. And so we need to, to continue to educate Vermonters about that uh, real life uh, situation. Dr. Levine. Uh, the only couple words I'll add to that, you, you, you cited sort of the best case and worst case scenario in the state, but it wouldn't surprise anyone that uh, throughout the state, the performance in the five to 11 year olds mirrors that of their parents. Uh, so high performing counties versus lower performing counties sort of are the same for that set of data. But the other thing is that, um, you know, through January and even now, we continue to have school-based clinics and opportunities around the state. Uh, we're not really letting up. Uh, we will be at some future point, but we're not, uh, we haven't been letting up and uh, not allowing a variety of settings for getting the vaccine, whether it's a healthcare provider, a school or community-based clinic or a pharmacy, um, those are still all available. When it comes to the to dropping some unnecessary mitigation measures in the schools, maybe this is a question for Secretary French, like students not having to wear masks outside and things like that. 
Are those also just recommendations for the schools? Are you pinpointing schools that are doing these unnecessary things and trying to get them to drop those? Or yeah, we're providing guidance uh, again. Uh, this wasn't mandated to begin with. It was guidance, and uh, we'll continue to give guidance where we think it's appropriate. And it won't be targeted to one specific district. It's overall uh, what we've heard, what we've seen, and what we can do now in the future. Secretary French. Yeah, I, the governor's, I mean, we, we're trying to approach this in a general way. Certainly we hear instances of these things. I think, you know, the what surfaced in the last couple of weeks, particularly as we're contemplating the sort of, I'll call it glide path towards an endemic disposition towards the virus. Um, you know, on the one hand, we have the science, and on the other hand, we have the perception of the science, and it's that perception of the science, the metrics and so forth, that's created a lot of anxiety inside of schools. And what we started to notice is some of these mitigation approaches that people think they're out of an abundance of caution doing these things, they're really contributing to this heightened anxiety inside the school. You know, for example, I've heard of a school that um, has not been allowing students to use their uh, library at the elementary level because they didn't want to open a, a larger congregate setting for students. But if you can remember what it was like at elementary school, and you might have enjoyed going to the library, and often in our schools, the library is the hub of the educational experience, if not the physical location of the building. What kind of message does that send to students that like, you know, if you had to explain to an elementary student, why can't we go to the library? You know, because of COVID, fear of COVID, you know, it's not. So we, we have to really start to just confront those issues right up. And I think that is something we can all work on. I think individually, we have to work on our own comfort level with risk, but then collectively, and to the governor's point about being respectful and, um, you know, just being kind to our neighbors, everyone's gonna have a different approach to this, um, sort of perception, if you will, of the risk. And we've all, you know, particularly in schools, we've been through a, a pretty uh, amazing experience the last two years. For many folks, it's been traumatic. It's certainly for most, it's been stressful. Um, and that those filters need to just be explained and talked about openly. Um, but now's the time to start confronting those types of issues, because I think that ultimately will ease the transition to when we start changing the larger health mitigation recommendations at the state level. And again, I think those are going to happen broadly in society. It isn't just going to be schools. Um, increasingly, we'll see the no need for specific mitigation recommendations inside of schools. For some of those overly cautious schools, I guess just in general, how confident are you that they, that come February 28th, if the 80% is reached, that they actually will follow the state recommendations? Yeah, I mean, we, we know schools have, uh, you know, really accepted our recommendations when we put out there, you know, with the mask you know, to begin with the school year. So I, I think there's been a high degree of, uh, I would say, compliance, but uh, willingness to follow that direction at the state level. But then again, you know, as we're seeing across the country, this will become a local decision. So we also want to be respectful of communities' willingness and uh, readiness to move forward in these areas. And these, as we saw, you know, in the first year of the pandemic, sometimes it's more difficult coming out of the mitigation strategies than it is coming going into them. So uh, we want to send a signal, put the tools in place, but also be respectful of that local decision making so we can get the majority of people moving in the right direction. Just to uh add to that as well. I think there are going to be a number of schools who are going to decide on their own uh, that they don't want to wait for the 80% threshold and that they will move forward with uh, mass removal um, before they reach that threshold uh, as well. There was one other, and, and Secretary French, uh, I don't believe I talked about this one, but uh, in some schools, and I, it was surprised me, I guess, uh, to learn that uh, in in some schools, uh, while kids are having lunch, uh, they actually uh, have to do it at different times. They're in different rooms, uh, and they actually turn their chairs around, face the wall, to have their lunch six feet apart. And uh, the anxiety level that must uh, bring to kids and what they've been experiencing over this amount of time. And think about, um, even at the height of the pandemic and all the mitigation measures we put into place, uh, you could still go into a restaurant or a bar, uh, for that matter, and take your mask off. Uh, and uh, yet there are some students that weren't able to do anything like that in schools where they're actually probably much safer um, than they would be in other situations. So that's what uh, brought this to light. And uh, we think that it's important that kids get back to normal, uh, to tamp down the anxiety and, and the anxiousness uh, that uh, that exists in the schools right now. It's having an effect on our kids, a negative effect on our kids. Governor, 
Considering that we are very close to the two-year anniversary of uh, COVID's arrival in our state and the, the first deaths, also considering Vermont's excellence in stone carving, both in granite and marble, I wonder if your administration has considered anything like a call to artists to, um, you know, commemorate uh, what this pandemic has meant for our state. Of course, Vermont already has monuments to polio, uh, Spanish flu. Um, we've heard from some families that think that it would be a nice thing if, uh, if the state would commemorate their losses in such a way. Any thought about that? Yeah, I, I think it's a good thought. Um, obviously, we've had our head down paying attention to the task at hand, uh, which is the pandemic. I uh, haven't had uh, uh, thoughts about um, after uh, the pandemic, um, but um, but I think in, in months and maybe the next year or so, uh, we should contemplate that. I think it's a good idea. We've been through a lot uh, and uh, and for people to reflect on that, And but we need to get through it first and we're, we're getting closer every day. Governor, what do you make of the <clears throat> proposal that passed through the Senate, the charter change, uh, Brattleboro, letting uh, 16 and 17 year olds a vote in uh, municipal elections? Yeah, as I've said uh, in other areas with charters and charter changes, I, I just think it should be consistent throughout Vermont. Um, so if we're going to allow 16 and 17 year olds uh, to vote, uh, we should take that up on a statewide basis and make that decision uh, as well. You know, it, it, it isn't lost on me. Some of the conversations we're having in the state house right now uh, about brain development and decision making and, uh, and sealing uh, records and, and, uh, and, and discharging uh, some some offenses uh, because the brain isn't developed enough for 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds. It gives me, I, you know, I have to question whether that's a good idea uh, to allow them to vote at 16 and 17 years old. So suffice it to say, I'm not in favor of that proposal. I wanted to drill into the uh, tax proposal a little more as sure. well. As, as you know, love to talk about taxes. <laughs> yes. or, or tax relief, I should say. As, as you know, the legislature seems to be moving in a somewhat different direction, uh, at least with their $1,200 annual child tax credit. Uh, is, is that something that, that you would support? I, listen, I, I think any tax relief is important, um, but we don't have an infinite amount of... Uh, of money to do that. Um, so interestingly enough, um, our tax proposal is about $50 million. Uh, their tax proposal is about $50 million. Theirs is much more targeted to a different group. I think it's uh, mostly for, for those with children um, and up to people making a little over $200,000. So it's a smaller sector. I think it reflects about 10% of the population maybe. Ours is much broader and, and affects uh, uh, different age groups, demographics, and different levels of, uh, of opportunity. So uh, ours will help about 25% of Vermonters. So I, again, ours will, will help a broader group. Um, theirs is uh, targeted to a smaller population. But if there's a way to combine the two or to do both, I'm in favor um, because I think that uh, we are Again, a very uh, high tax state, and uh, and I'm thrilled uh, to see uh, the legislature considering any tax relief at this point in time. Mr. Bolio. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Uh, so yeah, the governor has the details right there. Uh, H510 is the child tax credit proposal that's come out of the house. That's for families who have children uh, six and under. Um, so as you heard from the governor, the, the package that he put forward is really affecting a broader swath of Vermonters, signaling that, that we'll support them through a number of different stages of their lives, right? Sharing the goal of helping families with young kids, but also families with kids who are older than that, or maybe young workers who are starting their career who don't have children yet. Um, so we're, we're excited again to be debating the details of this. I'm hopeful the legislature will, will take under consideration some of these proposals that we think are, are very effective to provide meaningful tax relief to a number of different demographics in Vermont that, that need some help. All right, we'll move on to the phone, starting with Lisa, the AP. 
Uh, thanks, Jason. I'm sorry, this question was already asked. I couldn't hear some of the earlier questions. Um, do we have a sense for how many schools or how our schools are near that 80% rate of vaccination? Yeah, Lisa, that was, uh, that was asked before. We don't uh, have the exact number at this point in time. We're trying to put it all together. Um, there had to be some agreements worked out between the Department of Health and the Agency of Education. So we just want to make sure the number is correct. Uh, it's not as high as we hoped, but but we'll see when the numbers come out, and we'll be able to re report on that, I think, uh, next week. And that's where you said you think it's like half, or they're like at 50%? No, I, I don't. I don't believe that to be the case. Um, I believe okay. it's a smaller number, um, but oh. we have to determine, you know, which schools and and the populations of the schools and so forth. So, we'll uh, we'll be able to give you accurate information when we obtain that. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Greg, County Courier. All right, we'll try Aaron Patanko, VT Digger. Hi, um, about the uh, the school mask um, you know, requirement and the end of it, um, we don't currently track how many cases are happening in schools. So are we going to know if this, end of the rule is going to cause a rise in cases um, and closures among schools? Well, again, uh, Aaron, we have for quite some time have focused more on hospitalizations than case counts, uh, but we continue to see case counts uh, drop as well as hospitalizations drop. But we do keep track of uh, the age groups, maybe not the schools, but we, we keep track of the age groups uh, from zero to 11 and then uh, 12 to 18, I believe, or something of that nature. So it's uh, the categories are there, so you, we can draw conclusions from that. Uh, Dr. Levine? Yeah, Aaron, uh, every age group in the state is dropping uh, quite precipitously in terms of our cases. Uh, and we did show one slide earlier that demonstrates that. But specifically, we also have a report each week on the pediatric age groups, and the rate of cases in that grouping is now very close to the general population uh, rate. Uh, and for so long a time, it had been much higher, and it has really come down very, very nicely. So we do think that um, cases across the age spectrum that are in our K through 12 schools are uh, having a very nice drop off. Okay. Um, I also, I kind of wanted to know, you know, what is the long term future of how you will use masking in schools? Is this going to be a permanent shift towards unmasking? Or if another variant comes by or another wave occurs in the coming months and years, are you prepared to um, require schools to mask again? Yeah, to clarify, Without a state of emergency, we recommend that schools require. But, yes. but besides that, um, the reality is, and I do like the way the CDC director refers to this, you know, masking uh, is often referred to as a layered mitigation strategy. Um, and it can be layered on or uh, withdrawn depending upon the environment that you're in and what's going on. So none of us in Vermont, in the country or the world, see another variant on the horizon right now, which is great. Uh, but obviously, we all know things can change, and so we have to be very, very observant and make sure we know ahead of time if one is coming. But the reality is that uh, it is a layered strategy. And as it gets withdrawn, if the climate around stays the same, there should be no need to uh, put it back into play. And that would go for schools, that would go for uh, indoor public settings, general population, whatever strategy you're talking about. So uh, I would not advise people throw their masks away forever and burn them in a big bonfire saying the pandemic is over. But at the same time, we don't see anything coming right now. And as these things do improve, uh, the masks won't be necessary in 
could be reserved for a time that they would be in the future. Um, I also, I noticed, noticed that you said many public health experts are calling for this, um, but I haven't necessarily seen any sources or studies that you have cited saying that this is safe or that it's necessary for students. What do you have to say to parents who say, well, maybe the psychological effects of um, having a mask are balanced out by being able to stay in school because, you know, masks prevent outbreaks, masks prevent school closures? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, if you uh, canvas and survey the parent community, you will find viewpoints on all sides, uh, just like you can find a public health expert on one side or another, should you choose. But there's no denying that there have been harmful impacts uh, to our students, social and emotional development and academic development in schools, which is what we're very much focused on. At the same time, um, the mask itself shouldn't be looked at in isolation. It's an integrated process where we look at uh, not only dashboard data such as hospitalizations and serious outcomes, which are pretty much absent in our schools, but we also look at vaccination rates. We look at the opportunities for testing and what testing has uh, shown us in various settings. And all of this is integrated together. And I think parents um, should understand that it's not one particular point that is being uh, taken in one direction or another, but it's an integration of a lot of information together. All set, Aaron? Okay, thank you. There, there are a number of um, studies that have been done. There was one hot off the press today. I haven't had the chance to look at it, but um, if it's something uh, pertinent, uh, Aaron, we'll be sure to get it to you uh, as well. I mean, I, I do, I watch CNN quite a bit and and um, that's not exactly a right-leaning uh, media source and there are a number of uh, experts there uh, that are saying it's time. So I think, uh, I think, I think we'll find uh, in, the, in, in the very near future, there'll be a number of studies that are, will be coming out advocating for this. All right, we'll move to Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. I believe my question is for Dr. Levine. Dr. Levine, you mentioned the efficacy of the boosters dropping after four months, according to some studies. Will Vermonters be able to seek a fourth shot? Or will they need to wait for CDC guidance? Will they need their doctor to prescribe one for them? How's that going to work? Sure. So let me uh, just quote you uh, from the study uh, that the CDC provided. If you looked at the uh, efficacy for hospitalizations, the booster uh, the, the efficacy dropped from 91% to 78%. That's still pretty robust. So most people are looking at data like that and saying, well, there's no emergency to get the rate to 90%. We would like it to be at 90%, but at the same time, it was still quite high. And so the impact of having the booster was significant. Four months later, uh, it had dropped to 78%, but uh, we don't know what goes on beyond that. So longitudinal studies will be very, very important. But there was no uh, urgent need based on that data. It was more reassuring that there was still a robust amount of efficacy. Now, having said that, um, people are always concerned about the duration of time and the presence of perhaps other variants beyond Omicron that might impact these numbers differently. Uh, and that's why this is still an ongoing um, study, really, to be able to ascertain that people's immunity will stay where it should be. And this is also limited to more um, 
conventional studies of immunity as well, and I think we're going to make some maturation in our ability to understand how well people have uh, retained memory cells and other aspects of their immune function uh, as time goes on. To answer the question about Vermonters, the uh, only people who've been authorized for the so-called fourth dose are those in the category of immunocompromise. So we obviously continue to provide that for that population. It's done by self-attestation at a uh, state site or at a uh, pharmacy or with your own uh, physician so that uh, anyone in that category should be readily able to get their shot. In terms of the general population, just wanting to have an extra dose, uh, we're not counseling people to do that at this point in time. And um, that is not something that is a national policy. None of the bodies that make recommendations regarding vaccination schedules, like the Advisory Council on Immunization Practice or the CDC or FDA, have actually weighed in to say that should happen yet. So uh, we are going to not break new ground in Vermont in that arena. We're going to follow the science, and when the science tells us we should actually offer these extra boosters, that will happen. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Fauci was on the call with the White House this morning, and he pretty much said everything that uh, Dr. Levine had said, that they're not ready to... Uh, uh, to commit to a fourth uh, booster uh, at this point in time. They need more data and uh, just don't think it's necessary. And he said the same thing about the 78%. Uh, that's still really, really good and to prevent severe illness So, and stay out of the hospital. So they're, uh, they're going to continue to, to uh, collect the data. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, governor, um, as in your as governor and in your previous political life in the legislature, as lieutenant governor, you um, not favored creating um, ongoing e expenses, and it seems with your, your tax plan that, um, especially as in regards to the tax credit, it creates a, a de facto ongoing expense. And I'm wondering how, and I can see the legislators saying, oh, well, you know, the governor is, is going along with that. Maybe we'll do some other stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering how you, what, what you think about, about uh, that creating um, uh, essentially an ongoing um, obligation. Well, again, it's strategic in many ways, whether it's to attract more in our workforce, which we desperately need, give a tax break to uh, the working uh, poor, uh, and that that is uh, effective in helping out in some of the programs that we have. Uh, but we're also seeing a lot of general fund growth, as you know. And uh, so I'd rather s spend it in that way uh, to give uh, tax relief to our overtax uh, residents of Vermont than develop new programs. So developing new programs, um, I think, is uh, that, that we can't afford in the future. Uh, would be uh, it would hurt the cause. Um, we need to fix some of the the problems uh, that exist today. And, and again, I think uh, I think Vermonters are overtaxed. We've seen whether it's the military tax uh, that uh, that all but uh, three other states or three states in the country have uh, have done away with. Um, and again, the EITC has proven to be. Uh, very effective, and uh, so we need to, we've experienced that, and, and I think that it will have uh, beneficial uh, results as a, as, a, uh, as a means to, to help those uh, living in Vermont. But again, attracting people, we need more people in the state. It needs to be more affordable. So, so that, that's the, the sort of the crux of it, because you could, you could uh, you know, you're talking about 10% of the legislature's I'm talking about our 25 percent of the population you're talking about well if you did a, a general income tax cut or a general property tax cut it'd be almost 100 percent of the population so is it really that that sort of workforce development strategic part well of it? we would we would entertain that as well uh, if you want to add that in any tax relief packages uh, that we can put together uh, we would contemplate uh, but again our proposal just affects the a broad demographic uh, of our state 
um, from from young to, to, to elderly. Um, and part of it is strategic in trying to attract more people uh, to the state, again, that we desperately need and keep more uh, of, uh, of those graduating uh, from our colleges, universities, and high schools and tech centers to stay here in Vermont. So we just have to make it more attractive for people to stay as well. Uh, on the economic front, any, anything the state can do to help out Burlington with the, um, the mall closing down, it, you know, it, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be a hole in the ground. Well, I mean, that's an ongoing issue that uh, the mayor has taken on, and uh, I think that they're, uh, they're dealing with that, obviously. Um, we're, we're trying to, I mean, we use the, the TIFs and so forth to do everything we can to incentivize renovations within communities. Um, I, and, and it's not to say that I'm um, not concerned about Burlington uh, or Chittenden County, for that matter. But I am much more concerned uh, about the other uh, 11, 12, 13 counties throughout the state and the rural areas uh, of the state that really, really need our help. Uh, so I'm going to focus on, uh, on the forgotten counties and uh, to make sure that we can, we can help them uh, to regain uh, some of their uh, economic independence. All right, great, thank you. Anna Van Dyne, VPR. Hi, yeah, um, I have a question about contact tracing, so I believe that'll be for Dr. Lazine. Um, several weeks back, the health department began encouraging Vermonters to do their own contact tracing since um, the state's resources couldn't keep up with the high number of cases. So given that, along with the rising prevalence of at-home testing, as well as the shift we seem to be experiencing in the pandemic, I'm wondering what is left of the contact tracing force dealing with Vermont's COVID cases and what specific kinds of situations or cases are they focusing on? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we've actually been telling Vermonters to think about all the things about contact tracing for a very long time now and have had this on our website. Uh, so the principle being when you test positive, you need to know you have to isolate and what to do about that. Secondly, to try to understand where you were in the 48 hours before uh, you became symptomatic so you'd know who you were with, what circumstances you were under, and you could begin to inform those individuals very early, much earlier than any contact tracing workforce could possibly work. Uh, knowing of the inherent delays in a system that relies on getting the result and then getting somebody to make phone calls. So um, what's happened most recently is with the rise of Omicron and the rapidity with which it spreads and the amount of contagiousness it has, traditional case investigation and contact tracing have stopped making sense from a public health standpoint not from just a Vermont public health standpoint, from a general public health standpoint. And that's why the public health um, structures around the country and state health official and epidemiology organizations have all said something to that effect. So it's really that general population contact tracing that actually is not efficient enough in a broad scale sense across the country to deal with a variant like Omicron, and that's why individuals can deal with it much more effectively. So our contact tracing workforce, which we still have uh, with regards to Omicron, is still working in very high vulnerability settings. So we have outbreak response teams that respond in long-term care settings, homeless shelters, uh, correctional facilities, places where there's congregate living. All of that's still very important, and that continues on. And then, of course, people don't even recall there's a whole contact tracing workforce dealing with non-Omicron infectious diseases that are very traditional diseases that we've had forever and ever, whether they be sexually transmitted diseases, tuberculosis, uh, gastrointestinal illnesses, et cetera. That continues on as it always has been. Does that answer your question? Um, mostly, yeah. Um, 
so to expand a little bit more on that, um, is there a point at which contact tracing will no longer be useful um, at all, even in those settings that you um, just described? Like, is there a point at which it will become sort of obsolete as a way of um, containing the spread of the virus? No, no, absolutely not. Um, for the broader set of infectious diseases and for SARS-CoV-2 virus, it will still be relevant. It's just that uh, one has to then be very focused in applying it because of the populations that are at highest risk for serious outcomes. Uh, but for something like Omicron, for the general population where it spreads so rapidly and it's very contagious, and it predominantly in the non-vulnerable people produces very mild or almost no illness in many, um, it's no longer an important tool. But it's not something that's now outdated and will never um, be needed again. It's, it's still a core public health tool. Thank you. Joseph Gresser, Martin Chronicle. Joseph? All right, we'll move to Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Governor, uh, <clears throat> have you gotten much feedback about the military pension tax so far from the legislature? Is that one of those they're willing to move on? I have heard um, where they may, um, uh, well, certainly from, uh, there's a caucus uh, there's a, a military a National Guard, I think, caucus uh, that is highly involved. They had a press conference uh, recently on the subject. Uh, I think that was effective, but, uh, but I haven't heard anything directly to me about it, no. Okay, thank you. Another question. Um, <clears throat> the, recently, we were reporting from uh, information we received from the <clears throat> state police office about uh, saturation patrols. And uh, this particular one uh, was, was held from uh, 9 to 11 in the morning, on a Monday morning. <clears throat> and uh, it picked up six traffic stops, including um, four people going over 90 miles an hour and then one person with a DUI. Uh, our readers were, frankly, shocked. At, uh, they weren't shocked about the 90 miles an hour. They can see that, but they also, the realization that more people are impaired at different hours than it seems like they have been. Uh, is That practice seems to be pretty successful. Is that something that might get increased as big, please? I might, uh, might ask Commissioner Schirling to, uh, to respond to that if he's on. Certainly, um, the state police traffic safety team uh, is constantly assessing uh, the efficacy of of different tactics to try to ensure highway safety. So um, we haven't discussed this in, uh, I haven't discussed this in detail with the Colonel, but I imagine um, replicating successful initiatives is something that uh, you can anticipate would likely happen. Commissioner, do you, do you see it as the saturation patrols being a successful initiative? Uh, based on your description of that particular one, yes, I think uh, when they're done, in a way that's uh, informed by trends, by um, oftentimes informed by where we're getting complaints about aggressive driving and, and things of that nature, uh, and informed by data. Um, we've, uh, we've asked for, or we've had some uh, data analysis done on the relationship uh, between uh, traffic crashes and enforcement and trying to correlate those things. And that work continues with a new uh, records management system as well. Um, it's really ensuring that you're you're using the limited number of resources we have as effectively as possible, and um, so it's it's not just randomly putting out saturation controls. It's uh, as long as they're informed by um, the information that we we've, we've got, um, and then they continue to yield results. And it's something I think uh, that makes sense to replicate. Do you ever have uh, ask the, the state police to go out and ask for? more hotline types of reports from people who are on the roads? 
I have not asked that question specifically. I know that we get a, uh, and every time my radio is on, there's a significant number of reports that are coming mm -hmm. over uh, the radio frequencies about uh, people, uh, Vermonters calling in uh, aggressive driving. So uh, I'm not sure it's something we need to encourage more of um, in a specific way. I think Vermonters are doing a pretty active job of it already. Okay, thanks very much. No other questions. Hey, Tom, maybe just to add to that, because I, I did read an article mm -hmm. about this. Uh, it does seem like there's a negative residual effect of the pandemic uh, in terms of driving, um, either impaired, uh, driving recklessly, m higher risk um, as, a, as a result of the pandemic. And I'm sure that we'll be studying this for a while. But as you probably know, we had more deaths on our highway last year than uh, we've seen recently. Uh, but that is uh, th that is being seen across the nation as well, and it just has something to do with the pandemic and risky, riskier behavior. So um, we'll uh, we'll continue to to study that um, and uh, and see you know if that uh, if we're able to to transition out of that as well. Um, I did want to go back to the uh, you asked about the military pensions and one um, and it's. Uh, something that I'm concerned with in terms of the legislature, they did focus on one piece of legislation, uh, as was mentioned, um, targeted for the those who, who have children upwards to over 200,000 in income uh, that would uh, would affect about 10% of Vermonters, um, would help 10% uh, of Vermonters. Um, what I, I think, uh, what I'm concerned with is that they pass that without really taking up our bill. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, for it obviously passed because there's a number of people on both sides of the aisle that maybe appreciate helping out um, those who need help and as well as giving tax relief. Uh, but when you don't have anything to compare to, um, from my perspective, that becomes problematic. So I'm in hopes that they will take up our bill and uh, give it a fair uh, opportunity. Uh, in the uh, in the legislature on the House side in particular, and then uh, send it to the uh, to the Senate as well, uh, because I think that both need to be uh, given their day in court, so to speak. Okay, much appreciated. Thank you, Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yeah, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, the, the shift in the student mask guidance. Um, uh, I, th I believe there'll still be a tail end of the indoor winter sports season um, by the end of the month and lasting into March. Do you see any um, shift in guidance for masking during uh, during sports, or is that even um, one of the measures that you might be calling for to be lifted before the end of the month? You know, I haven't. Uh, I don't believe we've talked about that as a group, but it's, it would be my understanding that we probably lift that at the same time, um, but maybe. Secretary French has the answer. Yeah, hi. I mean, you know, just to underscore, we're, um, we're making the announcement on the 28th. That's been in our guidance for quite some time, going back to August, albeit we did push that date back repeatedly, uh, most recently in January. Uh, you know, we're certainly, we want a message that we're heading into that direction of contemplating uh, the mass, and we're trying to do that in as thoughtful a manner as possible. So. Uh, districts will be able to ease and have a smooth transition to that and we'll certainly uh, assess to what extent that would apply to sports and um, again to what do what we can to help schools with operationalizing this as smooth as possible and uh, some of the um, anxiety and uh, nervousness that you described that the students are experiencing do you think um, simply a shift to uh, to greater normalcy will alleviate uh, that, or are there going to be additional measures that are going to need to be taken for the benefit of the students? Yeah, I think it's part of the puzzle, but no, I, I don't think it all rests on this. We have, as we've described previously, um, an interest in shifting the system towards what we call education recovery, and particularly at the state level, we have additional resources that need to be brought to bear. Um, those programs need to ramp up, but at the same time, we do need to address, I think, very directly uh, anxiety levels. And I think uh, as we contemplate uh, the education recovery planning, uh, sometimes it gets represented uh, generally as the idea of mental health, but I think there's a lot more to it. 
I think we'll also need a discrete strategy for staff wellness underneath that as well. Um, all these things have to be brought in together. Um, but I think it is important at this moment that we really, I think to a certain extent, take stock of the great work that's gone on, uh, but acknowledge that we're again at the, one of these moments of transition. The good news is we're on the transition of, of lifting some of the mitigation requirements, but that, that's hard work too. Um, but we need, to, we need to, as we have throughout uh, many of these transitions, seek to balance the public health risks with the educational risks. Um, and anxiety is a, is a pretty prevalent um, observation among school leaders today. When I talk to them, even pre-pandemic, uh, just the heightened level of anxieties that seem to exist in this generation. And certainly the pandemic's exacerbated a lot of those issues. And uh, those are ones we're going to have to take on very specifically and try to surface those best practices around the state. And I think that sort of transcends the mental health idea. But it's, it's clearly, I think, going to be situated in a broader plan of recovery for education. Thank you for that. A uh, quick one for Dr. Levine, uh, if I may. Um, uh, boosters, uh, somebody who got two doses of the Johnson & Johnson, is there any eligibility or need for them to consider getting an mRNA um, uh, booster? <clears throat> uh, that actually is recommended, so that, that could be fine. Oh, okay. that's, so if that, they, that's, if they that's, got the well, original so, Johnson. Sorry, I should qualify that. That's for the immunocompromised. For the general population, they had a choice of getting an mRNA for their second shot. Uh, but uh, that's as far as it goes at this point. Okay, so no eligibility for them to choose a third shot of something other than Johnson & Johnson at this point among the general population. Right. That there is no third shot yet for that group. Okay, thank you very much. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Good afternoon, Governor. The legislation has, legislature has approved teenage voting and holding elected, elective office in Brattleboro. What are your thoughts on 16 years old and older voting statewide, and will you veto this bill? Yeah, I commented earlier about this specific proposal. I think it should be taken up um, by the legislature on a statewide basis if we're going to have um, and, and not do a piecemeal across the state in just one area. I do question uh, whether a 16 or 17 year old um, should be voting in general elections. Uh, um, so I. I'm not favorable uh, to that proposal, but I think uh, regardless, uh, that should be debated in the legislature on a statewide basis rather than piecemeal in one uh, community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, is it ever appropriate for a vaccine under emergency use authorization to be considered for a mandatory requirement for public school enrollment? Um, not as far as I'm concerned, but I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. I think most of us would feel reassured that something was approved before doing that. Um, it's about all I can say. It's a hypothetical circumstance right now. Okay, thank you. Wallace Allen, yep, so Mike, True North Reports. Mike? Sorry, can you hear me? Am I beeping? We got you. All right, I'm here. Uh, great. Um, let me shut this door real quick. And is there, my question is, this regards earlier you were talking about uh, the incentives for schools to up their vaccination rate. I know you said that was a recommendation, but in any case, our question is, is this going to cause nurses and principals to coerce kids or families to get an experimental phase vaccine? And I think you just answered with Guy Page that if it's experimental, there may not be requirements for that either. But um, it, for the regular vaccine, do you think this could cause um, uh, some conflict between the schools and the, and the home? Um, I don't believe so. 
Um, okay. I think it's you know personal uh, choice and decision. Um, but the more mm -hmm. who are vaccinated and get to a certain level, uh, they would receive uh, some sort of financial reward um, to be spent on something mm -hmm. the student body would determine uh, th that they wanted to advocate for. So it's not in the interests of uh, the nurses or administrators. It's really about the kids. So, um, Commissioner Levine. Uh, uh, oh, and I just want to make it clear. The word experimental is probably not appropriate here. Something under emergency use authorization, you're not in a study uh, trying to figure out if this vaccine works or not. The vaccines that have been granted emergency use authorization have been through a very rigorous process. And the only thing that's lacking is the usual amount of time that the FDA waits to give approval so they give emergency use authorization during an extraordinary circumstance like a pandemic. But it's not an experimental therapy at that time. Um, and if I may, one more quick question. Um, are we studying, as a state, are we studying more about students who have natural immunity to the virus versus the, the status of vaccinated children? Um, again, I think uh, earlier I'd mentioned that there's this uh, notion that if you have have had the virus, uh, that you have immunity forever from that, and that's just not the case. Uh, that it's been clear uh, from data that uh, has been derived already, and, and I'm sure that they'll collect more data along the way that shows you can get it again, uh, and it does wane at a faster rate than vaccines. Dr. Levine? Yeah, and the, and the combination of what you're calling natural immunity with superimposed vaccine-mediated immunity is still considered to provide the best protection going into the future, uh, sort of a super immunity, if you will. Uh, the question you asked, are we studying Vermont students? No, we are, we are not independently studying just the children in Vermont. This is part of a bigger national picture. Okay, well, thank you as always. All right. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Ed Barber. All right, we'll move to Greg Sakanik, Bennington Banner. Thank you. Um, my question uh, is also about the um, masking policy uh, for the governor, for her secretary, French. What would you say to teachers and staff who are concerned about the lifting of mask mandates, particularly if they are immunocompromised or caring for family or loved ones who are at greater risk? Secretary French. Hi, Greg. Yeah, I think you know we'll we'll have a broader recommendation for schools, but I think where where every where everything's heading ultimately is down to that sort of individual assessment. So if there are individuals that need a specific accommodations, whether it be in school or in other employment settings, they should be working with their employer. Uh, but you know, to the governor's earlier in, uh, in initial comments today, this idea of respect and kindness to each other. I think you know we we need to accept a disposition that uh, personally we might need to be wearing masks and what how we think about the risk might be different than the person next to us, and we need to get to a place where that's okay, um, and I think that will play out in schools just like it will in the broader society. Thank you. I'm just trying to catch up with your quote. Um, are there any vaccination requirements? thought of being considered for the next school year for staff as a recommendation or as a requirement by the, by the agency of education? No, that wouldn't necessarily be an agency of education requirement. Uh, you know, there was a conversation at the national level with OSHA that would have had implications for school staff. Uh, at this point, it's really up to the specific school districts uh, to contemplate that issue with their staff. And I know several, maybe a handful of districts have moved forward with that, basically leveraging their employer-employee relationship to require uh, vaccination. Uh, but it's not necessarily something we would uh, enact at the state level. 
All right, thank you very much. That concludes my question. Lisa, the Waterbury Roundabout. Lisa? Good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yep, we got yes. you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Um, for Secretary French, I suppose, um, you know, nobody wants to go backwards on this, uh, the trend that's happening in schools right now. I know we're seeing our cases in our school district go down and attendance is getting better. Um, but I know a lot of school districts had an explosion of cases right after the January break ended and everybody returned to school um, with sort of haphazard testing at that point. It's encouraging that there's going to be tests going home with students this week that they can use before they return. Um, but it seems like the 28th of February is still during break. March 2nd is when a lot of schools are going to be reopening. Um, are you suggesting that they come back day one, no masks? Or um, you mentioned sort of increments, and I'm wondering if there's any sort of consideration for getting everybody back to school after break and sort of going through those days that they might need to be doing their second tests or whatever um, before germs start to spread that everybody's collected while they've been gone for a week? Um, I'll, first of all, I'll, I'll, let me, I'll make a few comments on that and let uh, others add to that. Um, we are providing guidance. We have said all along that uh, the 28th of February was a pivot day. We would make a decision, you know, we've extended this uh, for a number of months, and we have to make a decision. We told everybody we would by the 28th. So our guidance is uh, to lift uh, that uh, masking if you obtain 80%. Um, so this will give some time uh, between now and then. Uh, I don't think you'll see um, the vast majority of schools uh, who have attained that level. So it's not as though it's going to be um, the Wild West out there, so to speak. It's uh, very measured. Uh, and uh, incremental uh, and by design. Uh, secondly, um, we've seen, I mean, you think back, um, it wasn't just three or four weeks ago uh, that the legislature was still contemplating a statewide mass mandate. Um, I'm not sure that they feel the same way today that they did three or four weeks ago, but they were prepared to vote on a statewide mass mandate at that point in time. That just shows you how quickly Things have changed. And we saw this in South Africa. It peaked and then dropped like a rock afterwards. And we're seeing that here. We saw it in other countries. We're seeing it here in Vermont. We're seeing it across the country here. Uh, and we'll continue, I believe, uh, based on everything, all the data we've collected, it'll continue another week or two from now or three. Um, it, it could be much more dramatic. So I think. Our guidance, again, is incremental, um, it's measured, and, uh, and they'll be able to make decisions on their own. Now, a school might say, um, this is the state guidance, we might want to wait a, a day or two or a week. That's up to them. It's up to the school district to make that call. Uh, but there are going to be others who might say, we don't care if we uh, attain 80% or not, uh, we are going to lift our mass mandate. So. Again, that's just the way the district, uh, school districts work in Vermont. Uh, we're just providing the guidance. Secretary French. Yeah, hi. Uh, just, you know, just to be clear, uh, what we're announcing is that what was in our guidance uh, all along and most recently updated in January is that on February 28th, which for most districts is the first day back from winter vacation, um, that's when districts or schools that have greater than 80% uh, may choose to remove their masks. So it's not something that's happening in the middle of vacation. We understand there are several that um, extend their vacation through this, this particular uh, configuration when we have town meeting on the other side. <clears throat> but for the most part, the 28th is you know manageable and doable. It, it certainly will affect a very small number of schools, relatively speaking. But again, what we're, we're messaging is that we're on sort of this broader glide slope, if you will, towards endemic. Um, this is an important, I think, first step, albeit it does affect a very, very small group of schools. But we want schools to start thinking about moving in that direction. And I, you know, to your point about you know, where we were and the idea of no one wants to go back, I think that's a good one. 
um, and I think it just calls out you know some of the the challenges of the decision making. So we do, I think, have a perception now of the virus, of the virus sort of operating on a cyclical level with variants and what have you. Um, but there's a couple other factors that are involved in our decision making that aren't cyclical. And one, an important one, is particularly to draw a through line from the fall to where we are now, is that we've been increasingly lowering the risk uh, from the virus through vaccination. So we started school in September, as I mentioned previously, with no vaccination being available to 511. That's been building, building, building throughout all these ups and downs in Delta and Omicron. Um, as you know, Vermont's uh, the national leader, one of the national leaders in 5 through 11 vaccination and, and most all the other vaccination indicators as well. <clears throat> so that's, that's a linear progression that needs to be understood in our decision making. The other, the other one is the idea of risk to students from an educational perspective. And that also is a linear, uh, I would think, but it's also an accumulating uh, risk assessment. So unlike the cyclical nature of the virus, uh, students have been in this two-year experience. I put staff there as well. And the risks from an educational perspective are building and growing. Um, and this is where you see a lot of the national conversation emerging now and acknowledgement, even from a health perspective, I want to say even from a health perspective, because I think our pediatrician community has always been very strong advocates in this regard. Students need to be in school. That's, that's, a, that's a public health concern if they're not. Um, and you know, the, at some point, we need to keep reconciling these, these uh, competing uh, risks, if you will. Um, we're at that point clearly across the country, and particularly in New England, uh, that's the direction we're moving. So we're trying to do this in a thoughtful, incremental way as we have throughout the pandemic to let folks know uh, that's where we're going so they can be prepared to make those uh, transitions and have those conversations at the local level where those decisions will ultimately be enacted. Right. Well, well thanks. That's, that's good to hear on the, the incremental part. I just feel like I think a lot of people are, are seeing glimmers of progress right now, and there's just a, a lot of, you know, I guess just wariness that you know, the last thing everybody wants to see is, is to have a week off and then and then go right back to where we sure. were in January and, and see this, this merry-go-round start again um, with, you know, more cases and kids having to, you know, get contact tracing letters and testing and, and more spread. So sure. uh, until the window can be open, and, and that's one of the things that the school district folks are talking about, that soon when spring is here and they're able to open more windows, um, that ventilation will be better and that all of those things together are going to probably be a good combination to, um, you know, see a, a, a really serious drop in cases. Yeah, you know, I would, I, I appreciate um, what you're saying in that regard. I would just, again, I, you know, we're at a fundamental diff fundamentally different point in the Omicron curve than we were in January. We, we saw Omicron heading our way unbelievably quickly, um, but that's not where, we're our, where we are now. And I really just, you know, I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to send that strong message. This is not a time to invent mitigation measures out of an abundance of caution. The idea of opening windows, let's wait and put off and put off. You know, last summer we saw schools that still wanted to wear masks uh, during the summer programs out of an abundance of caution. When we're providing these recommendations, this is the best public health thinking on this. We really strongly encourage districts to heed that and follow the direction. Um, it's, you know, the, this idea of creating abundance of caution mitigation measures is, is sort of a downward spiral and it's hard to come out of that. Um, I'd really, you know, folks need to really tune in and follow those mitigation cues as they come out. Okay, great, thank you. I have one quick last question for Dr. Levine, if possible. Um, looking at the numbers on the, the dashboard today, Dr. Levine, it looks like we're just over 109,000 people in Vermont that have had COVID. Um, presumably the state knows who they are, right? If, if positive cases are reported, you know who's, who has had COVID. I'm wondering as you look ahead into the future um, with the health department and the, the data team there, is there any plan to be checking in with the, the folks that have had COVID to see how they're doing, to see who might still be having symptoms and, and dealing with what's you know, been termed as long COVID to see what they might need. Um, if people are back to work as, as they had been previously before they, they were sick to get a handle on how that population is, is doing from a public, public health standpoint. Yeah, so the 109,000 are predominantly PCR tests and so we do know who they are. Keep in mind there are people who will have done antigen tests and we don't know who they are unless they've reported to the uh, site. <clears throat> we're not checking in with each of the 109,000 but we are working with the University of Vermont uh, as we speak, accruing patients who have um, symptoms of long COVID and uh, working to understand uh, them better and see if we can participate in 
what's going on nationwide and worldwide in trying to understand that population better, understand uh, risk factors, understand demographics, understand uh, natural history. Uh, so all of that is happening, but that's only a subset of the entire uh, population that's been infected. That's good to hear. Do you anticipate being able to report on that in, I don't know, probably, probably months, months out probably to, to gather that kind of information and, and sift through it? But um, I think that would be really interesting for the public to be able to, to get a, a handle on what that looks like. Yes, no, absolutely. That's, uh, that's the goal. That will be months off. But again, you've given me the opportunity to tell the public that currently we still believe, for adults at least, a 10 to 30 percent chance of having long COVID symptoms if you've contracted COVID. Hopefully a little less so with Omicron, but we don't know that for a fact yet. It's too soon in time. So if you have not taken the opportunity to either get vaccinated or to become up to date and fully protected on your vaccine, keep those statistics in mind. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Lisa, just to pile on and reinforce, um, throughout this pandemic, over the last two years, you've heard us talk, all of us, uh, talk about listening to the health experts, watching the data, listening to the science. And uh, when you look at uh, the Omicron variant uh, and its um, predictability, uh, it's it's been incredibly consistent, both in its, traje but its trajectory uh, increasing and also decreasing. Uh, so that gives us great comfort when you look at other countries who experienced Omicron before us and have seen it decrease, uh, as well as other states who have started decreasing before us, and they're still decreasing. So we benefit uh, from that just again, listening to the science, watching the data, and making decisions that we think are appropriate. With that, um, we'll see you again at some point. I'm not sure if we're meeting next week or not. That'll be determined because it's a town meeting. Oh, wait, we have one more? Okay, we will see you next week. Town meeting is not next week, it's the following week. So thank you all very much.